to people here in person, to people on Zoom. It is a joy to be with you and to be able to share in this holy season of Advent. I'm so excited to be here in this space and to look forward to all of the different things that God has to teach us during this time. Um, so as you are able, rise now in body or in spirit for the call to worship. Can one be homesick for something never known? We are homesick for a just world, for peace like rivers, for the end of suffering. Yes, we are homesick for joy that is contagious, for nations that feel like neighbors, and for hospitals that run. We are homesick for the world God promises. We are homesick, but we are not perfect. God is here. God is still creating. Let us worship. Now I'm invited Barbara to come up and lead us in that ad. So the words here are not bolded, but if you'd like to join me in in reciting it with me, please feel comfortable to do so. We hope for a world we are all fed. We hope for a world with more bridges than walls. We hope for a world with wide open doors. We hope for a world with contagious laughter. We hope for a world where the trees grow tall and creeks run clean. We hope for a world where all people feel at home, in their bodies, in the church, in their physical homes. We hope for that world. We long for that world. We are homesick for that world. So today, we light the candle of hope, because hope keeps our hearts alive as we wait. May this light be a reminder the wait is always worth it. We are close to home. May we carry hope with us. Amen. Thank you <laughs> oh, for lighting. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and uh, for our first thing, we're going to sing at number 88, so come with me, Manuel. Uh, we'll do this every week of Advent, so we'll start with this week being the first week of Advent, we will sing through verse 1, and it is in your hymnal number 88, and uh, yeah, I'll give you a little introduction, and then we'll sing. Thank you. 
So now we enter into our time of prayer um, or celebrations. Actually, during this time and rolling with our theme um, for what well, we can replace celebration and laments with the things that make us homesick and the things that feel like home. And so for the things that feel like home for us, we'll say thank you, Jesus. And the things that make us homesick for another world, we'll say, Lord, your mercy in our prayer. So are there any things today that are making us feel homesick or making us feel happy? Yes, over the Thanksgiving um, break, my um, big pie that my mother who passed away used to make, mm -hmm. just like she used to. And I followed the directions just like she did. And I kind of looked up and said, Mom, I'm doing it just like you. Mm -hmm. And I miss you so much. But um, everybody that tasted it said, Oh my gosh, it tastes just like Mom used to. So it brought back many happy memories. So it was, it was Times to to bake and times that the ways that food really connect us to loved ones and memories. So for that, we say thank you, Jesus. We ask you to pray for your friend Lois, for Chicago, and the city of the city of the it's not going to be the lowest, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so we are homesick for a world where people can receive healing. Um, so for Lois and all the people who love her, we say, Lord, have mercy. I can add a thing that is making me feel at home. Just the joy of being able to celebrate this first advent with you all, and just to be able to to nurture this beautiful theme that comes to us from the Ministry of the Sanctified Art. They provide uh, the worship resources, the the liturgy, and everything. Um, it, it's it's humbling to know that we are worshiping with the same words and same themes that many people across the country right now. So that's something that I'm grateful for. Well, um, so I read this morning. And wow. He's home and he um, was um, getting ready to pack up to go back to Boston, but he said to say hello and then he was there for us. So, okay, he was home to stay for us. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, for being able to have connections, and I'm so grateful that you're able to see Brent. Um, and that you're able to feel that joy, and so things that feel like home, people that feel familiar, we say thank you, Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, for folks that are still coming in. We are now in our time of prayer. If there's any prayer requests or um, praises for celebration, in the any others? Yeah. yeah. They were able to come to my son. Oh. Okay. That's That's so amazing. So, yeah, it's great for us that your parents were able to be with you and your son for, um, for Thanksgiving. And Again, people that feel like home, people that feel like familiar. Glimpses of hope. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Any other things that feel like home, things that make us feel homesick for things to be different? Who's afraid? Gracious God, we are grateful for your work in the world. We are grateful for your continuous guidance over this community, the way that you sustain 
all of us, the ways that you are breaking into a world that often makes us yearn and often makes us long for things to be different. Um, but we are grateful for the ways that you continue to show us glimpses of hope, counters of freedom, all the ways that you are still in our midst. And we are grateful too for the ways that this theme of hope and things that we yearn for uh, point us to the coming of Christ, which we are celebrating at this time. The time that is mysterious is the time that pulls at our heartstrings and pulls at our yearnings. So uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to celebrate those people that we have been able to see, those loved ones that feel familiar that we are able to gather with during this season. We also pray for those who make us homesick for things that have not happened yet, for people who have not received healing, for people who are still aching and hurting and feeling sick in this world. God, we pray that you would comfort them, that you would come alongside them, let them know that they are not alone, that you would restore strength to their bodies and minds, that you would remind all of us of our power to bring hope to a hurting world during this time. So we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So we come now to this time of reading the scripture for the week. Um, this week it comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verses 25 through 36. This is Jesus talking, and he says, There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, but the heavenly bodies themselves will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud of power and great glory, when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. And he told them this parable, look at the fig trees and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. I tell you the truth, just this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly with a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on watch. And pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen, and that you may be able to stand before the sun. This is the word of God. So, thanks to the lectionary, we are not in the apocalypse again <laughs> for the third week. <laughs> um, but I sent this in my email. Um, the image that goes with this story, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but it's also in your email. But it's this beautiful image that was created uh, in order to create a sense of hope in the midst of mystery and calamity. And it's just really beautiful. And I hope that it can be a centering point for us as we move into all the scriptures that Adam will take us through. So this is the first one. It's called Awake to Wonder. So, you just read the scripture. Like many children, Christmas was always my favorite holiday. My mom was a good cook, a creative, someone who was innovative. She could take any leftover fabric or sparkle and make the most beautiful decoration you could ever imagine. And not to mention, she was also a great gift giver. She always had the most perfect way of setting things up around the tree and making everything feel magical. But of course, the most exciting thing about Christmas, especially for a kid, is not necessarily the day, but the excitement of preparing for it. 
And so I have memory, many memories of creating countdowns, making lists, taking note of all the things I wanted to give to people around me. But then when I learned about Advent a little bit later in life, I felt like I was already an expert on preparing for something really exciting. But as I got older and life got more complicated, and I started to experience life a little bit more, with more pain and loss and trauma, Advent took on a new meaning. I stopped wanting to rush the celebration so much, and Advent became more of a solemn and slow and mysterious time, a reflective space, a holding space for my pain, distress, and discomfort with the world as it is. A deep feeling that things are not quite what they should be, and it became a container for my deepest longings and desire for healing and restoration. What Advent offered was a story that oriented me towards human suffering and hope and helped me draw deeper. A time that took me on a journey towards something that feels a little bit like wholeness. Because you see, in the beginning of Advent, we are greeted not with soft Christmas carols or a comforting nursery ready to welcome the quiet cruise of a newborn or even a flashing red carpet ready to usher in the infamous Messiah. Instead, we are plunged into this very unpleasant scene that is rather strange and unusual for the season. And we've already been talking about the apocalypse again for a couple of weeks. We've thought about these scriptures, we've thought critically about things like the book of Revelation, we've talked about the end of the world, we've talked about the rapture. But here we are again, what is supposed to be celebratory, and here we are at what feels like chaos and destruction. An image that evokes feelings of fear and dread, where Jesus is warning his disciples about signs of the sun, the moon, and the stars indicating the arrival of something new. Signs of gloom and decay, signs of death and disarray. Like a machine that has malfunctioned, the earth is spinning out of control, what is supposed to be up is down, and what is down is going upwards. Things are falling from the skies, and oceans are rising, and people are fainting with fear over what has come upon the world. It's a place where hope feels really silly and God feels really absent because the very foundation of all that exists is tearing at the seeds. And for some reason, Jesus says, when you see these things beginning to take place, know that your redemption is drawing near. It's the kind of thing that makes our heads confused. It's the thing that makes us scratch our heads. The world is on a spiral, and Jesus is saying, this is the part where you pay close attention. This is the time to begin preparing for the presence and power of God. It's like maybe Jesus is confused and doesn't understand that the kingdom of God is supposed to be associated with peace, love, and joy. Maybe a little gentleness and a nice smelling candle. Not absolute turmoil and unrest. So maybe Jesus has his calendars mixed up, or maybe he wasn't paying close enough attention at Sunday school. Because there's no way that a world that is quite literally turning on its access could be a sign of hope for us. Because we pride ourselves on having the perfect plan and knowing what's going to happen next, and we're set on knowing how to decorate and knowing that everything is going to work out. We are not people who prefer to start the Christmas season with a mysterious and death-dealing saga. And yet this passage, this weird passage, is found within a larger section of Jesus describing the whole coming fate of Jerusalem. It has vivid and scary details, such as the destruction of the temple, food shortages, wars, and uprisings false prophets, natural disasters, etc. It's been interpreted in many different ways throughout time and space. Some have read it solely as a confirmation of the past. After all, we know that in 70 AD, the Roman conquest did destroy the Jewish people. 
And some say that Jesus was merely predicting this catastrophic event, which is still regularly mourned by Jews today. And still others read this text and only see that Jesus is talking about something in the future, something that hasn't happened yet at all, the end of the world. But in my opinion, the truth is a lot more complex than historical fact alone, and it's a lot simpler than anything that we could create using our multi-million dollar scare tactics. What I see is the Spirit saying that this text is not about the past or even the future. It is urgency about life right now. Because for thousands of years, people have waited for the end of the world with great anticipation. They've waited for the heavens to roar, for trumpets to sound, and for the Lord to descend from the air. And yet here, Jesus speaks directly to the matter of our own time. Because people have been thinking, people are concerned with what has come upon the world. And not only have the heavens been shaken, but entire worlds have been disrupted as well. Water levels are rising, hurricanes and other natural disasters are stronger and deadlier than ever. Clean water is a scarce thing throughout the world, and many people are still working more for less pay. A global pandemic that has upended our lives and forced people into isolation. And like Jesus, we also live under political turmoil and the squashing of empire. Lands have been easily seized, war, corporate greed, sexism, white supremacy, queer phobia. All of these are rampant in the world. And it means that the very forces that put Jesus' life and the life of his friends in danger are the same ones closing in on us every single day. It feels close to home. So of course Jesus is speaking with such urgency, there is no other way to speak when so many other lives are at stake. It's the kind of reality that makes us realize how far from home we really are. The world is not as it should be. Many of us have been taken from physical homes and many of us feel alone or isolated in various ways. And this first week of Advent speaks to our deepest journeys. To be free, to feel at home in our bodies, to live in safe conditions, to love who we love, and ultimately for our home to be whole, to be made right, to be made well. We long for that reality. We know we are made for it. So we are homesick for a world we have never seen before. Homesickness. Acknowledges the moments in our lives when we feel disconnected and off center or dissatisfied. And homesickness is also the thing that reminds us to keep reaching and longing for the world as a sheep. Because it's often difficult to maintain hope in a world like ours. And thankfully, Jesus enters this world and speaks words of hope to homesick people who feel far away from who they are from God and from one another. This is the world the Christ child is born into. Advent begins when it feels like things are ending. Just like hope begins out of the dark, out of chaos and absurdity, that's where Christ draws near. Like a rubber band being stretched too far, the signs of time mean that something is getting ready to break and something new is coming forth. That's why Jesus says that when we see things closing in and around us, these are our signs that redemption is near. It means that chains are falling and justice is on the way. Another world is possible. A world with big tables and no borders. A world where people are rehabilitated rather than punished. A world where resources are shared equitably, people live in solidarity with one another. A world with safe drinking water and air that is safe for others. A world that truly feels like home. And of course, we are not merely recipients of this new world, simply waiting on it to change, simply waiting for this baby to fix it all. 
Surely things are being corrected and surely things are being restored into balance, but it's happening often through us. We are the ones called to keep watch, be alert, stay prepared, and to not let our hearts be weighed down. We are encouraged not to hide from the pain by ignoring the signs or numbing ourselves as to not act. But we are always called to stay present to the possibilities that exist on the other side, the feeling of homesickness that is used as a resource to move us forward. This week, I was reminded of people like Nat Turner, an enslaved man from Virginia. I can only imagine the feelings of homesickness that he felt having to work in a place that did not recognize him as human. I am sure there was deep discomfort, a yearning for freedom and safety, yearning for home. Yet he was able to keep alert and understand the signs of the time. After seeing a vision, he was inspired to lead a massive rebellion that freed many enslaved people. He was an example of someone who read the signs and rose to the moment. The way that fig trees are signs of changing season, he knew the sign that something else had to be on the horizon. Something is breaking, something is coming forth. He was homesick for home. And he yearned for Christmas. He yearned for home, which means that he was always right with possibility. He refused to settle for things as they were. But through stories like it is, we see the ways that divinity shows up in the wreckage. Hope to a homesick world. And still hope does not always show up like this as a loud disruption. In a recent meeting, I was asked where my hope comes from. And I was surprised that I hesitated before responding. Of course, I wanted to say God or something. But the question invited me to think even deeper. Like, what are the signs that God is near? And what are the signs that things can get better? And so, like any good nerd would, I didn't answer the question directly. I told a story instead. And I said, it's like when I was in social work school studying trauma. Nowadays, we know so much about how disruptive trauma is, how it damages the brain, relationships, and communities. And I spent a whole course trying to figure out how it heals. And somewhere along the way, I realized that at least part of the answer is human relationships. And it was almost annoying that something so big had an answer that felt so simple. I think my hope is kind of like that. But it's not annoying. It's exactly how God whispers into the void, in small ways, through people, through community, through relationships, where everything is connection around us. When we see pain and disruption and we choose to disrupt it, hope is the stubbornness to want more for ourselves and each other. It's the power to say no to what is. It's the strength to reach for something else, to believe that another world is possible. Like sometimes it's going to a protest, and other times it's having a good conversation with a friend, and sometimes it's reconciling with someone who hurt you, and sometimes it's holding someone accountable. Sometimes it's a really nice coffee, and sometimes it's laughter. It can look like so many things, but it's the breaking, and it's the pulling, and it's the yearning for something else. All it takes is being able to look for the signs and understand our own moment. These are the things that heal our human sickness. So this Advent, keep watch, be on guard, and observe with great anticipation. When it feels like things are breaking, that's when something new is breaking forth. And then may we all take steps to move closer to the home God visions for us, and the home God is leading us towards a place that is truly saturated with hope, and peace, love, and joy. Are we there yet? No. But we are on our way. We are almost home. Mm -hmm. So I forgot to put in the bulletin, but how is this 
message moving in. Actually, I didn't. Okay, so we're going to keep it for you. This is going to be a good one. Yeah. All right, for a second, as you were thinking of home, because I was thinking of what is our home that is so meaningful for us all. But everything that was needed in your life was provided. That's the truth of earth. And that can help us. And we're not supposed to be us. What it must be like for people who are born to a refugee camp. Do they have the same kind of experience when they look back upon that experience? Because if they are on with it, then it's because everything is provided for them. That's needed for others. Otherwise, on That's always a possibility with every life that comes into the world that the conditions will not be present for the end of the day. It's already If we did, that is the lesson. That's the life that is made possible by those who provide the conditions for our own personal lives. And the other lives. There's one sickness wrong with the security. Something that's so essential. And there's been so many studies like on children and how we have relationships as a you know, A lot of times with, with parents, but just any at all. It, you know, they, they don't develop, they, you know, it, it's essential. And it's a built into how our bodies are. And one of my favorites, she said, Well, I went there with my children to see the story. And she said, Because I'm a survivor, and uh, then I said, It's a totally survivor, not seeing your eyes. I think I'm going to have to go with you. And she said, Yeah, but I was going to have to go with and then after the war, 
this is going to be obviously the theme that we continue to return back to you, but I'm so grateful for such good discussion and for your thoughtfulness. So we'll have a song and we'll keep moving along. So I know that the bulletin says one thing, but um, I asked permission earlier if the way the conversation things go, we can change and we're going to change. I hope that's okay with you. Um, I'd like to do hymn number 82, Come Out Long Expected Jesus. Uh, if you were here, I played it right before the ceremony uh, service. Sorry. Uh, so um, it's hymn number 82, Come Out Long Expected Jesus. And uh, I'll play a little introduction and then uh, we'll sing verses one and two.
And now in whatever language or words are most familiar to you, let us join together and pray with Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power. And so let us come to this table that has been set for us and that gives us glimpses of hope that we are moving towards during this season of Advent. The Holy One be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God in whose image we are made. To the creator of all, we give thanks and praise. Let us pray. Divine protector, mother of life, your love for this world is everlasting. As oceans burn and species go extinct, as children are made vulnerable in schools and our neighbors are denied at our borders, there is so much reason to despair. That you, O oh God, refuse to abandon us to destruction, Christ takes on flesh among us. In the midst of struggle, you are glimpses of hope, encounters of freedom, taste of what satisfies when so much leaves us empty. In these moments, we sense the closeness of your kingdom. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of justice and love, heaven and earth are full of your wonder. Yeah. You, O oh God, reorder the world into right relationship. You mourn over every creature and human sibling torn down by the altars of acceptable and civilized. You hold the name of every life lost, every soul that has been made to hide and shrink itself. You lift up those crushed under the wheels of injustice. You humble the arrogant and powerful. You hear the earth groaning under capitalism and consumption, and your fire burns in the hearts of your prophets, storytellers, and activists. With this hope and assurance, we turn to the witness of Jesus, whose teachings reveal a way to liberation. We seek his wisdom, we practice his courage, we remember his radical commitment to love, and also that, like so many other revolutionaries, his resistance cost him his life. And I wonder if we could read the rest of it together. I didn't put anything in bold. On the night of his arrest, Jesus shared a meal with his companions. He took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance. After the meal, he took the cup, blessed it, and shared it, saying, This cup that is poured out is the new cup. Spirit come now and settle upon these things, making this bread and this cup for us a holy encounter, reminding us that Christ is with us, that moments of resurrection are available to us. Make us one with each other and one in each other's struggles. Until we feast together. May we be nourished so that we might have each other's. So now, as you're able to come forward and receive this meal, the peace of Christ be with you. Thank you. 